Good afternoon. Hi, Philip. Hi, Patrick. Hey. Good afternoon. Good to see you both. And good afternoon, everybody online. Great to have you with us this afternoon for another edition of SportWorks Talks. Um, great to having you join us from around the world. We, we observe everybody who's registering and, and really grateful to have you with us this afternoon. Um, as always, um, be grateful if you could just say hi in the chat. Um, tell us where you're from. That would give we know where you, where you are around the world. Um, so this afternoon, uh, a really um, fantastic presentation, which I think you all will really greatly enjoy um, from both Philip and from Patrick. Um, really uh, amazing piece of work that they've both com completed um, and a very important piece of work uh, to support S4D, but S4, SF4D, sorry, I'm, I'm now mixing up my acronyms already. Um, so Patrick and Philip, great to have you with us this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for these kind words, uh, Christian. Thanks, thank you, and thanks SportWorks for hosting us. Uh, thank you, uh, Patrick, for the journey over the last year and a half. It's great to have uh, published this white paper, and it's uh, hopefully only the beginning of a, of a fascinating journey. Um, while we start and share some thank you, I'd like to thank also um, the UEFA Foundation for Children, which has uh, been supporting us since the start. Uh, they recently celebrated their five years. Uh, but also a special thanks to our SWAT team, um, Anne Catherine, uh, Diogo, Manishi, Sarah, Marisa, and uh, lots of them probably listening now, and also Paul from ACD and Sport and Development, uh, who did a wonderful uh, a review of the final draft. And also thank you to all the uh, Sports for Development NGOs, um, especially those which responded to our survey last year. So we had 44 of them. And uh, more specifically, the seven of them which are featured as a case study in the white paper. Uh, we would have loved to feature every single one of the 44 uh, uh, NGOs which responded to our survey, or even more. Because these guys are doing a wonderful job. Uh, many of them doing that job for 10, 15, 20 years uh, and changing the lives of young people around the planet every day as we speak. And, uh, and really, uh, we were. Uh, very impressed with the quality of that work. So instead of summarizing uh, close to 200 pages in, in 20 minutes, um, we'll try to tell you a little bit more about ourselves and the journey and how we met and, and what sort, sort of started this, this efforts towards um, joining and combining two fields that tr traditionally don't really talk to each other. Um, the, the, the whole thing started a year and a half ago uh, when I met uh, Patrick through a joint uh, friend and former colleague of ours. And um, for you to understand, Patrick comes from the world of, of, of uh, finance, sustainable finance, impact investment and development uh, aid programs uh, with a solid experience on the field. And, and my background and experience is more in the sports industry, having spent the largest part of my career uh, uh, going around the world with the IOC and, and working on Olympic Games and youth Olympic Games. But I've always had that passion for sport as a school of life, for sport as an amazing uh, leverage to transform positively the lives of young people and local communities. Um, and, and funnily enough, an anecdote is back in the mid-90s when I was a young guy studying geography at university, I, I already presented a seminar on development of sports in Africa. And a few years later, as I was an intern at the IOC, um, I, I also did a piece of research on a, a project combining IOC and UNHCR in refugee camps where they used to send uh, sports kits with balls and nets. Um, and that was really the early days of sports for development because such projects had, didn't have really much structure, planning, impact assessment, reporting. It was really the early days of sports for development. And over the last 20 years, this, this field of sports for development has really, really developed uh, very quickly with uh, some wonderful players. Um, over the last couple of years, I've, I've also uh, spent more and more time looking at the notions of well-being and health and how sports, physical activity and active play can kind of help uh, uh, address some of the uh, sanitary uh, challenges that we face in terms of lifestyle. And, and when, I, when I met uh, Patrick, I basically explained this idea of, of combining the best of, of innovative finance because I had recently discovered some amazing developments in, in other fields, in the, in the prison industry, in uh, education, in, in agriculture, in other fields where 
um, people about 10 or 12 years ago started to develop things called social impact bonds, development impact bonds. And while I was reading this stuff, I realized, hey, why hasn't anyone developed such tools and mechanics uh, with sports as, as a catalyst for change? Uh, and this is how it all started. So maybe Patrick, you should tell us how you reacted when I first shared these ideas. And, and you basically don't come from the world of sport, but suddenly you hear, hey, sport could be a tool, could be a catalyst. What, what was your initial reaction? Yes, it, it, it seems yesterday, Phil, when we met in that cozy bistro in Lausanne to <laughs> our friend, um, I have always been interested in working around uh, mobilizing finance for development. So how to combine financial sector, private sector with development cooperation. And I've worked many years in Africa, in Mozambique and Madagascar before joining some of the large financial institutions here. And, and my other passion is, is sports. I'm a big sports fan and, and practitioner. So when you first told me that I could combine two of my big passions, I, I, I felt almost a bit overwhelmed, you know, and, and puzzled whether that would be possible. Uh, I think we have gone through a long journey, and as many many times you meet with people, you discuss ideas, and you get excited, and you start thinking about doing something. I think I feel very proud today because we've actually been able to 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 accomplish this first piece of, of hopefully a much longer journey and 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 produce you know publish this white paper, which again I ho I hope is 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 only the start for something much much bigger and more meaningful. Yes, and and something we realized also the two of us was the, uh, the particular positioning of, of Switzerland being uh, one of the hearts of uh, financial history in terms of financial innovations. There's a lot of institutions here who are very active in terms of sustainable finance. Um, and, and also, obviously, uh, the country being the hub of, of most of the uh, major sports organizations and, and leading uh, governing bodies. So there's a great combination, as well as uh, some UN offices down the lake uh, in, in Geneva and lots of different NGOs. There was really a, uh, an environment that was very much in favor of such development uh, taking place here. So Christian, if you don't mind maybe uh, moving us to the slide deck and uh, we can start uh, a couple of, uh, of introductions and words. So that's the, the cover and table of contents of our white paper. And um, uh, we understand it's going to take a, a bit of time to go through the, the entire document. And we thank you for joining us today and taking the time. Don't hesitate to get back to us with some remarks or, or recommendations or ideas after you, you have uh, gone through that uh, document. I won't go through the details of this very busy slide, but basically the question here is, is to what extent is uh, sport physical activity for all and active play uh, to be considered a bit of a silver bullet? And, and in fact, I'm quite amazed to see on a weekly basis, more and more scientific and medical evidence that shows how uh, positive sport physical activity can be in the lives of individuals. And, and that has to do with physical health, mental health, social health, the notion of living together, of social inclusion, of confidence, of self-esteem, of gender equality, um, but also other notions such as the acquisition of skills, uh, the employability of people. There's so many, so many benefits that sports can bring to people. And here we're facing the number one challenge, I would say, which is in, in my experience in the, in the world of international sports is is very much the fact that sport is still essentially considered as a leisure activity, an entertainment uh, or a business opportunity, as sports is an industry that is driving billions of dollars in professional leagues and players, etc. But the notion of sports physical activity as a leverage to accelerate the journey towards the Agenda 2030 is still very much undermined or under-recognized, I would say, in political circles and, and uh, economic circles as well. And the benefit of, of sports is, is, is really tremendous because it's integrated, it's multidimensional. So it makes it difficult to isolate one factor and to say, okay, sport is just great for physical fitness and health because you hit several uh, targets at the same time and it's quite challenging to isolate one factor rather than uh, others. But that's at the same time the beauty of it. And in our white paper, we've come um, to this um, sports for development compass. And the reason why we call it a compass is that it, it can help guide organizations, be it delivery organizations in the fields or investors or funders, 
to really look at the focus they want to have through sports for development. And if you start from the center, uh, the notion of active living, active lifestyle, active playing, active learning, we know that kids learn better when they are fit and active, when they, they, they move more. From that nugget somehow, you can really drive a number of benefits from an individual or collective point of view, from motoric skills to improved life skills, uh, to uh, better gender equality or youth empowerment, etc. So a huge number of benefits. We're not saying we are being exhaustive here in the middle circles. There's certainly another couple of notions you can bring in there, but it's fabulous a number of, of uh, connections that are possible. And ultimately, all of these benefits contribute somehow to one, two, three or more of the uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. So taken as a whole, um, and whatever the focus is of a, of, a, of a specific interventions in the field, there's really a huge potential for, for sports uh, taken collectively to drive a, a, a wonderful impact on uh, more active, engaged and, and empowered youth worldwide. Uh, and just to come back on, a, on an early notion that we had, we kind of focused on that piece of work on developing nations, low income nations. Um, but the mechanics, the reality of it, really applies to any country, anywhere in the world. I mean, even in high uh, income nations and, and fast growing cities, you have pockets of vulnerable youth. It can be immigrants, it can be uh, people on the dole, uh, on, on low salaries, low training, etc., who are more at risk of suffering from sedentarism, uh, uh, chronic disease um, and, and isolation. Um, so the mechanics of levering sports for development and generating social capital or social dividend works in, in all sorts of economies and countries, basically. That's what we believe, although in this piece of paper, we focus more on uh, low-income uh, nations. And a quick word before moving on to, to uh, uh, Patrick's part um, on the feedback we received from uh, the um, sports for development NGOs, which uh, took part in, in our survey. Uh, so, as I said, 44 of them responded, and, and clearly and not surprisingly, one of the major challenges is um, having sustainable funding available, and uh, not, not even to mention growing the funding, uh, scaling up uh, funding for more impact and, and, and more operations in the field. Um, uh, so there's a big thirst and expectations from a lot of organizations in the field to really access new innovative ways of, 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 uh, of funding uh, their, their scaling up. Another key challenge that we observed, it's, it's, it's a challenge and also an opportunity at the same time. The challenge is also to be able to access the proper tools and matrix to measure impact, uh, to show the causality and direct impact of an intervention on, on the, the youth in the field, um, and also then to report. But to be honest, when we went through the different uh, organizations, uh, especially those we worked uh, on, on, the, on the case studies that, that are featured in the white paper, we were quite stunned and impressed by uh, the maturity and uh, the effective way they measure uh, impact, but also the way they get audited by an independent body uh, to be able to be accountable towards their different funders. So uh, lots of very, very interesting uh, lessons from there. Taken as a whole, um, we also you know, keep uh, that, that major challenge of, of advocacy and perception in mind. Uh, there's, there's a need in a very fragmented environment uh, to be able to speak with one voice and to make sure that political leaders, economic leaders understand sport is more than, than watching a football game in a, in a big stadium. Um, so a, a lot of work needed there. Another challenge we see is that sort of disconnected field in, in sports for development. There's a lot of actors, a lot of players in that field. The traditional long-time uh, well-established NGOs are there, but there's more and more international federations and governing bodies investing in sports for development, not just for the sake of their own development, but making their sports available for uh, local communities, sometimes with a separate dedicated foundation. But there's also now private entities such as professional clubs uh, and other types of initiatives that are popping up, uh, and sometimes with very innovative uh, combination and collaborations, and we do feature a couple of examples uh, in our work. 
One of the challenges we, we um, uh, met and, and heard about several times was also the, uh, the decision in 2017 by the, uh, the new, then new Secretary General of the United Nations to um, stop the uh, UN Office of Sports for Development and Peace. So we are kind of left since then in, in an environment where uh, the leadership is not really clear. So there's a, there's a big question mark around that, but also an opportunity for a couple of leaders to, uh, to establish themselves, uh, we, we believe. Um, so monitoring, evaluation, learning, uh, there's still a need for a number of organizations to improve. There's a need to align the different tools and methodologies people are, are using because it's a great diversity. And these are the type of things we will look into in more details as we move to the next stages of, uh, of the journey with Patrick and hopefully uh, that we'll be meeting uh, a couple of major players to bring around the table, around an alliance to be able to scale up uh, some of the best players and more effective players in the field. So um, I believe I, I pass you the floor, Patrick, here to just tell us a little bit more about um, the state of the art in, uh, in innovative uh, finance and a couple of examples to better understand that aspect. Yes, thank you, Phil. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat and I just wanted to say that it's great to see people joining from everywhere, from Rio, from Argentina, from Africa, the United States and even Switzerland. Uh, it, it really feels being part of a global community and also see Cedric, a special thanks to you for making this possible. Um, moving to the innovative finance part, you know, what is the whole discourse about? What's the value add? Basically, the, the implicit promise and, and premise of innovative finance is that it can mobilize more money for development projects and programs and also make the available money uh, be spent more effectively. We all know that the, the magnitude of the problem is huge. You know, according to some estimates, there is a funding gap for the SDGs of, of two to three trillion a year. Official development assistance is not large enough. It's about 150 billion. So everybody's looking where else can we actually find, you know, more money. And that's, you know, everybody's looking at the, at the private sector, the financial sector, acknowledging that it will not be possible to use all of this money or, or not all investors actually do care about this. But, but there is a, an increasing number of investors that are including social governance, environmental consideration in their investment decisions. And some of them are actually actively looking for investments that create a positive impact. You know, this number is increasing every year and gives lots of hope. Uh, I also would like to say that innovative finance is, is a set of financial mechanisms. Many of them are not actually new or innovative per se. The innovation is more in applying it to international development and in the ways NGOs, foundation, development actors can actually mobilize resources or spend money. So traditionally, NGOs would, would receive grants to implement programs. You know, innovative finance opens up new doors from crowdfunding, from soft loans, uh, to outcome payments, uh, to actually get more money, but also to deploy to, to some of their beneficiaries. Um, there are a couple of additional benefits. Uh, you know, there's a strong component of, 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 of private sector entrepreneurial mindset or attitude that, that turns around innovative finance. It asks for collaboration between NGOs, public sector and private sector, which is not always that easy. It always gives the possibilities to link payments to, to, to the achievement of, of, of specific outcomes. On this slide, you just see the full menu of different financial mechanisms. There is a lot of complexity in there. I just would like to say that different instruments uh, uh, serve different objectives. So financial instrument, for example, you aim at mobilizing money from many, many, many investors through funds or bonds, for example. Risk mitigation mechanism is a way where you provide more comfort to investors that fear uh, you know, there is too much risk in, in investing in specific jurisdictions or sectors. Result-based financing, as I mentioned, is about linking it to outcomes. So there is a wide array of, 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 of mechanisms. I think finance is only a, an instrument, a mean to, to a larger objective. So it should never be the, the, the starting point. And you have a great example to share. Yes, exactly. Um, I think one, one example which, which I think is really impressive is, is a development impact bond. 
you know, there has been a lot of discussion around this type of instrument. This is taking place in India. It's called Educate Girl, uh, the Development Impact Bond. So in India, as in many other places, you have many girls out of school, especially in rural areas. And what's new here is that you have a, a charitable foundation from a Swiss bank, UBS Optimus, that is actually providing upfront capital to pay for a social intervention, which is conducted by an NGO, Educate Girls, which has been selected in a competitive process. Uh, and Educate Girl will work, has, has been working over three years to, to, to bring girls back into schools and also improve numeracy and literacy rates in the schools, working closely with the government as well. What's special here is that you have a second charitable foundation in the UK, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, which actually committed to pay back UBS three years later, if and only if specific outcomes would be met. So the initial foundation, the Swiss foundation, has actually taken up the risk of the intervention, uh, while the, the UK foundation would only pay for results or would buy the impact three years later. And I think this is a very interesting example. In the education space, uh, development impact bonds have been applied in different sectors from health to youth employment, uh, agriculture. So I think there are no limits uh, as long as you have uh, outcomes that can be clearly measured and, and, and attributed to a specific intervention. I think maybe also to share a bit, uh, sports for development is a rather new field for me, but I think from a design perspective, there is not much different with other types of intervention. I, I think there are certain things that are really important in the work of development actors that we do see in, in our everyday work, um, focusing on evidence on what works, I think is really important. We have just conducted a, a large review around child labor, where we have been able to map over 120 interventions, and, and we found out that less than 20% actually had clear impact evaluation report. So I think there is a you know a clear message of the importance of, 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 of collecting data and measuring evidence, especially also for innovative finance mechanism, because investors will ask for, for, for that kind of evidence. And, and, and also to embed the, the idea of sustainability in the intervention. I think uh, the onset, when you start something, it's important to, 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 to plan from the beginning what will happen once the intervention, intervention ends. And that's also evaluated from these types of mechanisms. Patrick, can, can you maybe tell us a bit more about that challenge of, of measuring and assessing in terms of workload? Because for a number of small NGOs, it's quite a, a big ask. Uh, for them to spend, uh, you know, uh, resources on measuring impact, reporting, getting audited, etc. So how much can this be streamlined in order for the majority of the funding to really go to the beneficiaries? I mean, obviously you have to find the, the, the middle ground. Uh, I mean, it's very important. Uh, at the same time, it should not overwhelm any organization. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, any, any development organization is, is creating impact and needs to be able to properly assess and validate the impact it creates. And that starts, you know, with clear impact gap analysis, uh, understanding where the challenges are, and, and then through the theory of change, what will be the output and outcomes. And I think that's something that the impact investors and, and you know, funders in general around innovative finance are, are asking uh, for. It's maybe interesting to note that in, in our survey, we realized a, a small percentage of the uh, NGOs actually mentioned uh, some dedicated revenues coming. It was usually um, um, rent of facilities or uh, consultancy for other organizations or merchandising, typically, uh, as a few examples. And that could potentially be scaled up as well for some organizations as part of a regular revenue resources that is controlled by themselves. Yeah, so maybe if you just, uh, if you let me add one point, Phil, I think what's really important is that, that we acknowledge there are many high impact organizations that are actually creating value for the society and the environment, which are actually not priced, you know, so they're not able to get remunerated for the social outcomes. And I think through this innovative finance mechanism, there is a clear vision of, 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 of pricing and paying for, for, for social impact. 
Anything else on the opportunities and challenges for NGOs, Patrick, in terms of uh, designing these new tools and, and innovating? Any any particular lessons from other fields you want to share? I would just like to say, I mean, there are many opportunities and there are many challenges, you know. On the opportunity side, you know, it's about finding and working with new partners, accessing new resources. It's about money, but also expertise. It's hopefully getting access to longer term funding and more sustainable sources of funding. On the challenge side, there is a lot of complexity. Um, I think a mistake I, I often see is that organizations, they, they tend to focus on a specific instrument. They say, I want to do a development impact bond or I want to do an impact fund, which I think is the wrong way of looking at this. You mm -hmm. need to start with, with your core capabilities, expertise, and the problem in the field, and then you will find the most or best suited financial mechanisms. Uh, I said there's a lot of complexity, which means there is a lot of, of, of co high cost involved. It needs time to develop this kind of initiatives. And, and obviously when you bring NGOs together with, with private sector or financial sector, there is also often a clash in, in culture and, and organizational uh, perspectives, which needs time for, for, for you know, building the, the trust base that is required to make something happen jointly. So tell us more about this bottom-up approach and uh, understanding the local context before you engineer something funky. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think it's, you know, this is not rocket science. I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it, it, you always start in the field. I mean, the, the people here that are working on the field, they, they know best, uh, you know, what the challenges are and what is preventing certain things to happen or what's preventing people to improve their, their livelihood. That's a starting point, which is combined with, with, with the strength and, and expertise that each organization brings to the table. Uh, there are solutions sometimes implemented in other countries or in, in in other sectors that can be applied based on that you, you start looking for partners and, and for financing modalities so uh, you need to find the right partner and the right mechanisms uh, to you know to, to work towards such a, such an initiative I, I think that really important is, is is the bottom up so starting from the problem and not starting from the from the financial instrument and, and in two words to, to finish off, um, Patrick, would you be ready to tell us a little bit how you see the next six to 12 months? Because I'm sure we get the questions, you know, how, who would we engage first and how do we tend to move forward? I mean, this is only the beginning and we need to manage expectations as well. Yes, I mean, as we said, Phil, I think this is the beginning of hopefully a long journey. I mean, what is really remarkable is that Switzerland brings many important pieces to the table you know we have uh, lots of of of, of, of um, know-how and expertise on the asset management uh, you know in financial services side in the impact investment side some of the first companies have actually uh, were born in switzerland we have a strong humanitarian tradition many many big and large ngos as well and we have all the sports organizations so i think already in switzerland we have a lot of capital available many of these actors unfortunately are not coming together and are not speaking enough to each other um, so hopefully this is is the start of building a coalition of interested partners in switzerland but especially also elsewhere in the field and, 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 you know, building more evidence, because I think that's crucial, and then bring to scale the most successful uh, programs and interventions. Well, thanks very much. And um, uh, Christian, I suggest we move back to you and, and we'll take a couple of questions. I'm sure we, we should have a few or, or you have a few. Absolutely. Great presentation. Um, thank you both uh, for taking the time to put that through and taking us through. Um, very, as you said, uh, to, to start and understand uh, what you've created. And as you say, it's the beginning of your journey. Um, so exciting and, and busy times ahead, I dare say, for both of you. Um, so thank you both. Um, really, really insightful. Um, so I'm going to start with some questions. We've got one here from uh, Shruti. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, can you imagine a situation where a ministry of sport of a country would borrow money from a development bank and uh, build the sporting ecosystem in the country? Uh, have you come across this in your experiences and what is the scope for this potential? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, to me, it raises the question of how you value a social dividend and social capital. And, and to me, the, the beauty of these mechanisms that we are exploring right now is 
what I call the virtual virtual circle. By bringing the best players around the table, you can provide a guarantee for government funding to be better leveraged and to, to deliver more impact. So I do see or do think that a Ministry of Sports or a Ministry of Health or a Ministry of Education should definitely consider seriously investing into physical activity and inclusive sports as an accelerator, a leverage and a catalyst for whatever objectives and purpose they have uh, on their targets. I don't know, Patrick, if you have any other experience. Yeah, first of all, I'm glad that you are starting with a difficult question, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I think it's a great question. I just wanted to add one thing. We mentioned the example of a development impact bond. Uh, you know, there is something called social impact bond, which is the, the same instrument about applied in, in developed countries. And the first one was actually done in the UK with young prisoners, where they realize that there are many young prisoners that go out of prison and within 12 months they go back, causing huge expenses to the government's budget. So in that case, you know, the, the, the intervention was financed by, by foundations and impact investors. The government, if successful, would save money over time and they acted as the outcome funder. So they paid back the initial investors upon successful intervention because they realized with the success of the intervention, less people would go back to prison and they would, you know, spare the government's budget. So I think there's certainly uh, room for thinking about such a thing. And, and just to add on that point, uh, in terms of the calculation, there's a direct correlation between not being physically active enough, being overweight or obese, or worse, getting also diabetes. And then the impact is on the capacity to learn to get the skills, to get employability, and to be productive for your family, for your community. So the, there's a direct cost impact in terms of productivity from the fact that people are too sedentary and, and don't move enough. And, and that's true, again, in different contexts and different countries. So definitely was, was the investment from a ministry or public body. The question is, again, how do you work out the equations to give a value, a financial value, to improved lives, basically, and more active and productive lives. I guess as a follow-up to that, Doug, from your experience, you mentioned you know, multiple ministries there as well. So it adds that complexity. It doesn't sit with sport, doesn't sit with health, mm -hmm. doesn't sit with regional development, which, again, I'm not gonna, let's not open that can of worms because that's another whole podcast. Um, no, but, but, but thank you very much for that intervention, Christian, because it drives me to an interesting innovation in finance in the budget of New Zealand. You all know the new funky prime minister they have. For the yep. first time, New Zealand, uh, probably one of the first countries to have a well-being budget. They have a budget for well-being, and they're looking at the collective well-being of their population. Uh, of course, it's not focused solely on sports or physical activity. It's well-being in general, but it, but it encompasses also culture uh, and the, bro the broader sense of well-being. So that, that's an interesting trend. Absolutely. No, and it's a great initiative. They've led the way many, in many, many ways. Uh, the, the, the New Zealanders are my Kiwi, Kiwi colleagues. <laughs> so another friend uh, from a question here from uh, Robert Cross. Thanks for your question, Robert. Uh, thank you very much for the UBS Optimus Foundation example. If I understand correctly, in the end, the cash flows originate from a non-profit charity foundation. Is it possible to design a mechanism based on for-profit for institu institutions? Or do you expect a large inflow of non-commercial funds from, from into S4D, charity government spending? Yes, maybe maybe I can start with this one. Actually, in 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 the in any development impact bond uh, mechanism, any investor can upfront the money or can do the initial investment. It, it has been often been a foundation that could be a private person, could be a bank, could be a family office. So they provide the initial cash flow for the NGO to, to pay for the actual work on the ground, you know, to pay for the staff and everything they need. While at the same time, the initial investor will is taking the risk of the success. And if it's successful, there is an outcome fund that will actually pay back the initial investor. So I think that's the first thing to say. And the second one, I think there are more and more also new mechanisms of working with social enterprises. So these are private or commercial companies that fulfill a social purpose with different ways of being organized governance-wise. And there are donors that are actually starting 
to pay the social enterprises for impact achieved because they realized social enterprises will never make lots of money because they work with, with, with more marginalized communities, but they are creating social value. So acknowledging that, they make payments for the impact, which strengthens and makes the social enterprises more sustainable. Maybe just a, a quick addition here as well uh, to clarify for everyone that when we speak about impact investment, we're not talking about philanthropy and giving out money for the good of the world. Um, there's, there's here a notion of capital retention or even a small return on investment if the mechanisms work and if the interventions are effective on the ground. Um, so that being said, what we are saying through our piece of work, uh, SFOD, is not, okay, let's get rid of philanthropy and move to something funky and innovative. No, we're saying, Philanthropy will remain the, the probably the biggest chunk of funding sources for S uh, for sports for development organizations. Maybe we can talk about venture philanthropy or more effective philanthropy with better tools and better uh, reporting. That's one thing. What we're saying is, is, in addition, we could explore a new territory which could really bring fresh uh, funding and investments into transforming people's lives and, and scale up the, the best uh, players in the field. Yeah. It, was, it was an interesting statistic you both shared in the presentation, um, you know, the barriers for organizations, and it was around the, you know, the top floor, the first one being 32% for fundraising, and the second one was, you know, tracking and outcomes. So I see that, that, that importance to secure the funding, so it, it feels like there's some great opportunities there to complete that, that, that wheel, so to speak. Mm. So another good question here from uh, Jack. Good afternoon, guys. Thank you for a really interesting uh, read in the white paper. A question I would uh, have for you is how much of an impact do you think currencies and FX has in funding efficiencies? For example, how much loss is there to either a funder or receiver in terms of value for money or resources available? Yes, maybe I can start and then feel you can complement. I think you know, speaking about my experiences with impact investments, so where investors are deploying money for a social cause, but expecting the money back, I think FX has a huge impact because quite often the money goes to, you know, uh, emerging economies, emerging countries that have very volatile uh, currencies. So usually, you know, investors could actually get their money back or even make a small return just looking at the intervention they support, you know, whether it's a vocational training center or a health center, but they often end up losing the money only because of the currency movement. And that's why often they prefer to work with, with, with a basket or portfolio of countries and currencies because that would kind of balance, you know, the different movements. Uh, and, and again, I'm not a financial expert here, but maybe one quick addition to what you said, Patrick, and maybe you can jump on this one, is the notion of de-risking. Because for a number of uh, institutions that are investing in development, um, it appears to be very risky to go to some markets or some territories. And there's also a notion of, in these virtual circles and alliance of key players, to sort of de-risk the investments for some of the parties or to slice different pieces of, of investment with more or less risks, depending on the expectations of the investors. I don't know, Patrick, if, um, if, if you agree with that, uh, that notion. Yeah, I think today everybody tries to push and find private sector investors for development. And, and there are lots of discussion around blended finance. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard that concept, which basically is the strategic use of, of, of development or philanthropic money to, to mobilize private funding. So many investors are actually saying, I would like to invest in the impact space. I would like to create impact. But once they see the opportunities, they start to be reluctant and feel uncomfortable because they've never been to Africa. They've never seen, you know, a health center in a rural area. So and that's where, you know, the, 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 the de-risking takes place, where development agency come in and say, I'm going to actually cover some of the risks. So the first 20% of money lost in case would be covered by me and not by the investor. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, thank you for that one. Uh, the next question here from Brian. Uh, so well, this is Brian from the Football Foundation of Africa. Uh, my question concerns the bottom-up approach and how this will influence the design of monitoring and evaluation frameworks. It has been noted that these are mainly designed in the global north and implemented in the global south. 
resulting in a mismatch as the frameworks rarely take into account the context of the interventions. The situation is compounded by the fact that S4D most research comes from developed economies. Uh, how are you going to address this imbalance? Thanks for the question. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. And and that was a remark we also received from uh, Paul in uh, SAD when he reviewed the initial uh, draft. Um, he, he had that comment of saying, let's be careful not to have too much of a Western-centric view on sports for development and the different tools and mechanisms. I think this is a very relevant proposition because there's a lot of uh, uh, NGOs that are based and were born in the South as well and are doing a wonderful job, sometimes with completely different methodologies or ways to measure impact, etc. And, and, and I think we have to be very open to this in a, in a way that I see it as quite challenging to agree on a set um, um, toolbox of, of M&E &E tools that you would impose to every single location, context and organization simply because every situation is very different. And I believe that the best tools and the best metrics are going to be the one that, that are dedicated to the theory of change and to the purpose of the organization and, and the community they are trying to tackle. So I would be careful to cut and paste the exact same uh, model and mechanics in terms of measuring impact and reporting. And I do believe in co-constructing uh, such a toolbox with the local people that are on, on the feed, they have been there for years delivering the programs because only they understand better what are the hurdles and the catalyst of, of their different programs. I, I would also add, you know, I think it's a super important point. I think if the design is taking place only in the north, it's going to fail. Uh, I think I think the idea of the bottom up is actually to evolve and include mm. local people, local expertise and knowledge. I mean, otherwise, I think it's going to be far away of reality. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a great point, and thanks for asking the question, Brian. And, and to your point, Phil, about you know engaging with those tool sets that have already been learned and developed in the local region is, is essential. We talk about it, the delivery of you know, major events in, in the sports sector. Um, we have to understand how to deliver it locally, um, whatever the, whatever the context. But I think that's a really good point that you raise. So, gentlemen, I, I want to say thank you both for joining us. Thank you for coming in this afternoon and sharing your white paper, um, a fantastic piece of work. Um, you know, as you say, it's the beginning of the journey now that it's published. Um, and looking forward to hearing how the journey evolves because you know, this is a, a great matching, I think, and a great concept of bringing the, together the funding concepts uh, of established methodologies just to a really important program uh, to hopefully bridge some of those gaps. Uh, so looking forward to see, seeing how it evolves over the years to come. I want to say thank you to you both. I also want to say a special thanks to all of our participants who joined us this afternoon. Great to have you with us from all over the world. I'm uh, really grateful that you've been able to take the time, whether it's in the evening or the morning or the or, or, or middle of the day. So great to have you with us as well. Um, I want to say and wish you all a, a very good afternoon. So, Phil, thank you. Thank you very much for hosting us. Thank you all for joining in. And Patrick, thanks for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Great. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.